Hello everybody, hope you're having a great day. Today we're gonna to be talking about pollinators, exploring the world of pollinators. This is such a huge, huge topic. So when I sat down to kind of figure out how I was gonna work through this, um, I kind of said, let me do it very generalized, talk about a lot of different things and just try and get you kind of interested in it. What can you do? Why is it important? Let's talk about pollinators in general. And of course, McDonald Garden Center, we're a garden center, so I'm gonna talk a lot about some plants. Um, you know, definitely that's one of the best ways that we can help support our pollinators is by planting nectar plants and host plants. We'll get into that, and we're gonna talk about a lot of different things today. So with all of our webinars, feel free to ask questions, leave comments, um, let us know where you're watching from, and that way we can kind of have a conversation as we go along. If I don't get to your questions right away, I will at the end. So I'll go back through everything and make sure I get to everything. But let's talk about pollinators. So lots and lots of different pollinators out there, right? Um, you know, and we're gonna talk about some of them a little bit more in depth here. But of course, I think the ones that come to mind most commonly are butterflies and moths, bees, and hummingbirds. So those are some of the favorites. Those are some of the most popular ones. They're some of the best pollinators for our area and we wanna protect them and do things for them. So why do we want to do these things? Why do we care? So hey, Trish and Williamsburg. Um, so why do we wanna care? So we should care because one out of every three bites of food that you take we can attribute to pollinators. That's how important they are to our food source. So they're extremely vital to the success of, of the human race. They're extremely vital to the success of plants. And so they help pollinate plants to reseed, to continue our ecosystem, to continue to have a great environment. And, and that's why they're so important. Uh, you know, for farmers, extremely important. You know, it's vital to the success of the farm. It's vital to the success of our food. And, and, and they're responsible, this is, I think this is an amazing fact, pollinators are responsible for 80% of the plant life on earth. So absolutely important, I mean hugely beneficial, and we need to kind of just recognize how important they are to us, our environment, our ecosystem, our food source, and that is why we want to talk about them, celebrate them, and protect them. So we've got Joan watching from uh, New Jersey, great to see you. Thanks for uh, liking our webinars. Um, so, very, very important to us, really something that we've got to pay attention to. So, let's talk about some of those key pollinators real quick so we can understand the differences between them, and then we'll kind of go in depth into some other subjects and kind of, like I said, I'll try and get kind of a general idea of why we talk about pollinators so much. So let's talk about moths and butterflies. Moths and butterflies are great pollinators. Um, they're actually both equally kind of good. Um, you know, moths actually do probably a little bit more pollination. We don't tend to celebrate them as much because maybe they're not as pretty as the swallowtail or the monarch or all the other butterflies out there. But moths are great ones. They, you know, typically are nocturnal, so they're typically out at night pollinating a lot more, whereas butterflies only kind of pollinate during the day. But both of them are extremely efficient because they need nectar to survive. So they're using the nectar as a source of food of these nectar plants. And then they, on their back of their legs, they have these kind of little kind of spurs that pick up pollen and they move them from plant to plant. So it's kind of by accident a little bit, I guess you could say, but they're great pollinators. Uh, it was kind of an adaption that obviously happened millions and millions of years ago. And that is what is helped pollinate these plants, is these little back legs that pick up pollen and move it from uh, plant to plant. So it's a really, really beneficial thing. Moths and butterflies are very efficient, and it's something that we wanna protect, not only for the beauty and watching them, but also because they help pollinate plants. Hummingbirds are another great example of pollinators. Now, same as butterflies, they're interested in the plants for the nectar source, but they spread pollen by accident as well. So it's a great one to kind of help pollinate. And they, the reason that I love hummingbirds as pollinators is because they're extremely hungry. So they're vigorous feeders, so they're you know, constantly looking for nectar. And what that means is they're always going and investigating flowers. And when you have something that wants to eat twice its body weight in nectar per day, then that means it's gonna visit lots and lots of flowers. And so we'll talk a little bit about you know, attracting hummingbirds, uh, but really, really good ones, uh, very easy to do uh, to, to attract hummingbirds to your yards with plants, but also with hummingbird feeders. So having lots and lots of sources of nectar is a great way to encourage them into your yard. And they're great pollinators because they visit so many plants. And then of course, bees. I think we all think of bees as kind of the number one pollinator. 
And that is because of a lot of different reasons, and they are one of the most efficient pollinators, to be honest. Um, they, are, they are great because they are actually going for nectar and for pollen. So they're visiting those, those flowers for both, to take them back to the hive, but of course, they get stuck on their fur and their hair, and they tend to pollinate lots and lots of plants because they're busy, they're workers. So let's talk about kind of some of the bees, some of the most popular bees. Um, and I know some people are afraid of bees, um, and, and so might not want to plant a lot of flowers in their yard because they're worried about attracting bees, but bees are extremely important. I mean, as we've mentioned, pollinators are very, very important. So what I typically tell people is bees are always gonna be more interested in the plants and the pollen and the nectar than they are ever gonna be interested in you. And you can do things like locate your local bee societies if you're ever worried about bees. Um, they can always give you more information Especially if you see a swarm, you know, a swarm of bees would be a bunch of bees, you know, kind of crowding around something, which is basically the queen bee. Uh, so swarms can sometimes happen. Then you would just call your local bee society. And if you know who they are, then they can come out and take care of it for you. If you've got a bee uh, colony that has, you know, nested somewhere in your yard and you want to get rid of it, then call your bee society. Don't go and kill them. Have, there's plenty of people that will go out there and, and collect those bees and start a hive of their own or continue that, that colony. So lots and lots of great things. So the honeybee is the one that's on the farthest picture there. Honeybees are extremely, extremely busy. They visit lots and lots of flowers. Of course, they're, they're doing it to support a big hive and a queen and create honey. And so they're one of the best worker bees because there's so many worker bees. The other reason that they're great is because it's easy for humans to help that population by having their own hives. And if that's something that you ever have been interested in, I go back to the Bee Society. You know, they are the experts. Uh, so find your local Bee Society. There's so many different bee groups. Talk to them about starting your own beehive if you want to, or just getting more information. It's a great thing that you can do. Of course, bumblebees, one of my favorites. Bumblebees are great because they're, they're probably the most common bumblebee that you see. And these are kind of really, I'm talking about the state of Virginia here, nationwide. I'm sure you have lots of these bees as well. Um, but bumblebees are a great one. They're very friendly. Um, you know, they, they, they tend to really kind of just concentrate on plants. And a lot of times you can work right in a, you know, a blooming, you know, row of salvia or agastache and, and there'll be bees all over the place, but they're not going to mess with you, especially the bumblebees. They really don't care about you. They are just there to kind of fly around and collect nectar and, and, and pollen. And so um, bumblebees are one of my favorites. And then mason bees are absolutely great too. Now mason bees typically will pollinate earlier in the season, which is great for people that might have orchards or fruit trees, things that you're trying to get an early production on. Um, so if you're talking about food sources, uh, then the mason bees are a great one. They're also solitary and very, very much non-aggressive. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about mason bees. I got some examples of some ways to attract them into your yard. Uh, but mason bees are a great when they're usually a little bit of a darker color. And then of course we all know bumblebees. And then there's over 140 other species of, 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 bumble, of bees in just the state of Virginia. There's so many different species and types uh, from small little guys to big, you know, carpenter bees that so many people uh, are worried about, you know, boring into the sides of their homes. Uh, but there's lots of great things that all bees do. They all are going to uh, go after nectar and pollen. And so we want to support the bee population in any way we possibly can. So bees are a great one. Let's talk about some other pollinators. There's lots of other pollinators out there. Now bats in the state of Virginia do not actually pollinate anything, but I bring them up because they do actually. I mean, they're huge to the, obviously like the bananas um, and different types of fruits, especially in the tropical regions. So bats are great pollinators now in our neck of the woods here in Virginia and maybe in most of the Northeast here. Um, they, they really aren't pollinators, but what's great about them is they are great insect killers. So they're insectivores. So they love to eat mosquitoes. So what do we do to control mosquitoes typically as humans as we spray insecticides? Well, what is harming the bees and the butterfly population? are insecticides. So we want to make sure that we're using less insecticides. So attracting bats into your yard is not a bad thing. I know people might say I'm afraid of bats, uh, but it's a great thing that you can do. There are great pollinators across the globe. In our neck of the woods, they're great insectivores that can help really you know, be beneficial. Uh, flies in general, just flies will actually go and visit flowers and they're great pollinators. Ants, I don't know if you can quite see it on that little white flower over there in that far picture, but there's ants all over that flower. Ants are great pollinators, again by accident, um, but another really, really good pollinator because there's so many of them. 
And then beetles. So, of course, that's a ladybug up there. Ladybugs are great insectivores as well. They're eating insects. So they're visiting plants and flowers constantly to try and find these bad insects like aphids and whitefly and different things like that. So having ladybugs in the yard is a great thing that you can do. And you can usually buy them. We have them at McDonald Garden Center. You can buy them from a local garden center. Uh, but they are a great uh, beneficial insect that accidentally pollinate lots of plants. And beetles are actually the number one pollinator in the world because of their sheer size and numbers. There's so many beetles that just by accident, they pollinate more plants than anything. So beetles are a great thing as well. So there's so many different things. Wind is a pollinator. Obviously, you know, we're, we're not lacking wind, but we wanna protect our pollinators. 80% of plant life comes from pollinators. So it's a very, very important thing. How can we help? Well, what, what have we done to, to hurt the population? Well, using less insecticides is a great thing. So I talked about that, using beneficial insects, attracting bats to the yard. We can use um, some organic insecticides that don't harm bees. There's lots of options out there for that that don't harm bees and butterflies. But what we really want to do is attract them to the yard using plants and places for them to feel comfortable and live. And we're going to talk a lot about that because loss of habitat is one of the main reasons that our, our uh, pollinators are declining. And so we've got to give them a place to live. We've got to give them plants to feed on, and we've got to give them host plants. We're going to talk about that here in just a second. But that is how we can help, is by doing what we haven't been doing, which is using less insecticides, especially on nectar plants. I mean, if you've got you know, some, some plant or shrub that's just an evergreen that's not necessarily in use by your pollinators, although I'll talk about that here in a minute, but uh, you can use you know, a little bit of those, some of those different insecticides, especially if you've got a major problem. But typically speaking, we're almost always gonna recommend an organic insecticide, something that's safe for bees and butterflies. Uh, there's lots of options out there. I didn't kind of go through and do a list, but that is definitely something that you wanna be careful of and mindful of. But also planting plants and giving them a place to hide and live. And that's a mason bee house. I'm gonna show you a little bit of a better example here in a minute. Uh, that's actually a huge one. I thought that was a cool picture. It's the size of the house almost. So it's a, a monster, monster mason bee house. Uh, but you can do lots of things to encourage them into your yard and plant plants that help them and do some different things. So let's talk about plants here for a little bit. I'm gonna kind of try and run through this list fairly quickly. Uh, I've got lots and lots of slides to show you pictures of, of great um, uh, plants that you can plant, um, at least in our neck of the woods and probably really in most of the country, these are amazing plants. So nectar plants versus host plants. We're gonna talk about that a lot, especially when it comes to butterflies. Butterflies are one of the easiest, I think, pollinator groups to get into. Nobody's afraid of butterflies. Everybody loves watching them. It's a great hobby and it's a great thing to do to protect our local pollinators and our migratory pollinators like the monarch. Monarchs are migratory. Um, so, so it's a great thing that we can do but you need to know the difference between host plants and nectar plants. So nectar plants are providing them food, providing them energy, and then they're accidentally pollinating plants as they do it. Their host plants is what they're gonna lay their eggs on. So the eggs are gonna turn into a caterpillar, the caterpillar is gonna eat that plant, that host plant. That's why that monarch is laying that egg on that milkweed right there because it knows when that egg hatches, it has something to feed on and last for a while. So this is a great thing to kind of know is you need nectar plants to attract them into your yard. You need host plants to keep them and breed them in your yard. So really that's kind of the biggest difference there. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about them, but let's start with nectar plants. Nectar plants are some of my favorites. I see Trish had a question. We hung a, humming, a hummingbird feeder um, at our new house, but haven't seen any. What can we do to attract uh, them to our yard or feeder? Well, Trish, that's a great question. Hummingbirds, of course, um, you know, love nectar and, and hanging a hummingbird feeder is a great way to attract them. I would plant more nectar plants for sure, but also try different locations. So that's kind of one of my major points whenever I talk about hummingbird feeders is try different locations. It's all about location. Uh, hummingbirds are also somewhat aggressive, especially when they find something that they really like. So sometimes you'll have one hummingbird visiting a hummingbird feeder and it won't allow any of the other hummingbirds to come. So sometimes you only get one and you're like, I only get one, I don't know why. Well, because that one might be warding off the other ones. Um, you know, plant it in a, or put your hummingbird feeder, not plant it, hang your hummingbird feeder in a somewhat of a protected area. It needs to be in a fairly sunny location, 
but it doesn't have to be an all-day sun. So something on a small tree, you know, a shepherd's hook where it's got uh, an area that it can go hide in fairly quickly. They're pretty worried about predators, so you want to give them somewhat of a protected feeling when they're feeding. So try different locations, hang multiple feeders, and plant more nectar plants. It's the best thing that you can do is just keep at it until you find that right location. Typically, you want a little bit of sun. Change your nectar. Very, very important. Clean your feeders. Nectar only lasts about, about three to four days um, when the temperatures are below 90 degrees. When the temperatures get above 90 degrees, it's only going to last about 24 to 48 hours. So you got to change your nectar. Uh, I like to put a little bit of nectar in first to start. Hang it, you know, keep trying different areas so I'm not wasting all my nectar. Um, and then once you find the spot, you'll start to see hummingbirds and then you can start to fill up your uh, hummingbird feeder all the way. So hopefully that helps you, Trish. But definitely plant some more plants like butterfly bush. So butterfly bush is one of my all time favorites, especially when we're talking about, you know, creating a pollinator garden, whether it's a butterfly garden, a bee garden, or just a pollinator garden in general. Butterfly bush, fill up some space and really add a lot of texture and look and they just bloom like crazy with these huge panicle shaped blooms um, that are absolutely amazing and there's so many different varieties out there now like the new pugster series that get uh, these humongous blooms on these tiny little plants so it's a great great thing that you can do to plant in your yard uh, Joan said butterfly bush is considered invasive and sales are banned in Oregon better alternatives so great great point Joan and, and every you know area is gonna be different a lot of uh, uh, the butterfly bush um, in, in our area don't spread very aggressively and don't typically kind of reseed and pop up in different locations, but every, every area is going to be different. So thank you for that comment, John. Um, but butterfly bush in our neck of the woods is a great option. So let's go on to salvia. Salvia is another amazing, amazing um, uh, nectar plant. It is a great way to um, bring in pollinators to the yard because it blooms early and it really can bloom almost all the way to the fall season. A little bit of deadheading might be required, a little bit of plant food to keep them vigorous, uh, but salvia is an absolute amazing one. And I'll talk a little bit about perennials and annuals as we kind of go through these, like the butterfly bush is a more of a shrub. Uh, it loses its leaves in the winter but comes back year after year. But salvia is a great perennial and there's amazing annual options as well. So salvia is a great one, plus it adds different height. You can get these in a lot of different shapes and sizes and colors, so you can add anything to your landscape. It's another great point is sometimes just planting a few plants in and amongst your landscape. If you've got, you know, a full landscape, but you got a couple pockets that you can plant some nectar plants, it's a great way to attract them. You don't have to devote a space just to a pollinator garden. We're going to talk about some different ideas as we kind of go along as well. Cone flowers are another amazing one. Cone flowers are great. They're easy to grow. Uh, once they're established, they're extremely drought tolerant. So echinacea or cone flowers, Really, really easy one. They've come out with a lot of different colors nowadays. They're great repeat bloomers. They typically don't have many insect or disease issues. They're super, super easy and very hardy to grow and are a great source of nectar. And they just have that bright color that you know the, the butterflies and the bees just really get super attracted to. So coneflowers is a great option. It's a great perennial. Comes back year after year in the Hampton Roads area. Zinnias are, are an annual in our area, uh, but it's another great one. I will, I will tell you, whenever we have zinnias here at the Garden Center, they seem to be the most frequented of all the flowers. Uh, so it's a great nectar source. Um, it's a great way to attract them to your yard. I like to plant zinnias in my yard near my vegetable garden because it seems to attract the most uh, amount of pollinators during that kind of warm season, that kind of you know warm uh, late spring to early summer time frame uh, when they just kind of really start going crazy. So it's a great option. And I'll stop now and say, the list of nectar plants is extremely long. I'm not hitting all of them. I'm hitting some of my favorites, um, but the list is just massive. So it goes on and on. Lantana. Lantana is one of the all-time uh, best, I think, easy annuals. And there's perennials, too. In our neck of the woods, we've got the Miss Huff Lantana that actually comes back year after year. So there's so many great options of Lantana. There's different sizes. There's trailing. You can grow it in hanging baskets. We'll talk a little bit about, you know, doing this in small spaces versus big spaces. Miss Huff Lantana is one of our most popular perennial um, uh, Lantanas that come back year after year. It gets big. It takes up some space which is nice if you've got the space and sometimes you just want to fill it with something that's easy, blooms a lot, and attracts lots of pollinators, then 
Miss Huff Lantana is a great one, but there's lots and lots of different ones out there. They all have different colors. Some of them are pure yellow. Some of them have more orange or red in them. Uh, there's purple ones that trail. There's so many different options when it comes to Lantana. It's an absolute uh, winner in my eyes as far as pollinator plants, but also just great, you know, ornamental plant to just grow for fun. Bee balm, very, very popular, especially amongst hummingbirds. That red color is very attracting to them. Those tubular shaped flowers, they call it bee balm because it also attracts bees, obviously, uh, but it's a great one. Uh, it's a great perennial and it's coming out in so many different colors and sizes now. Most of the red, you know, original bee balm can get pretty good size, can get up to 24, 36 inches high. Sometimes you might not have the size of the space for that. So they have lots of alternatives, some smaller ones that are great as well. So bee balm is a great option and great perennial. I'm gonna keep on rolling through these. I got lots to get through. Agastache is another one. It's another one of my favorites because it's kind of like in the salvia world, but it tends to bloom a little bit later in the season. I love that it's kind of it's in the mint family, so it's got this great aroma to it. Um, I just absolutely love the look of it. Um, it has that minty kind of fragrance and really cool blooms that last a long time. I mean, look at those massive blooms. Typically gonna be in this kind of lilac-y, bluish color, um, but uh, they do have lots of other colors out there available as well. But Agastache is a great one, and it tends to attract a ton of hummingbirds, especially um, here at the Garden Center. They tend to always be full of something uh, breezing by it and checking it out. Black Eyed Susan are another one. The reason I love Black Eyed Susan is because it's a super durable plant. It's extremely easy to grow. You can grow this in wet, dry, full sun, a little bit of shade it grows okay. Um, but they just keep on blooming and they are super, super easy. And I love that bright yellow color. There's nothing better than having a pollinator garden or even a landscape that has a mix of colors. You know, you're always looking for some different shades, some different textures, some contrast. Um, and Black Eyed Susan with that pure yellow. And there's lots of different types out there now um, of different types of uh, Rubeckia or Black Eyed Susans. Uh, but Black Eyed Susan, the original one, Goldstrom, which is this guy, is super, super easy to grow and just one of the all time best for pollinators. Uh, marigolds. Marigolds are typically grown as an annual, um, but they're very easy to grow. A lot of you know, farmers will grow these. A lot of people will put these around their vegetable gardens uh, because it keeps some of the crawling insects out, but attracts the pollinators. So it's kind of a twofold. Uh, so marigolds are a great one, uh, very easy to grow. A little bit of deadheading, pinch off those dead blooms every once in a while, spend a little bit of time deadheading them. Uh, but they're a great one. They you know, typically come in orange pom-pom or yellow pom-pom, but you can get them in so many different types of styles and shapes. Uh, but love pollinators absolutely love these. Uh, and it's a great option for an annual, especially for small spaces. Love to put these in containers with an assortment of annuals with maybe a, a milkweed, which we'll talk about here in a second. Uh, maybe a couple of other different types of pollinator plants to attract them. If you've got a small space, we're gonna talk about that a little bit more as well. Coreopsis, another one of my all-time favorites. They are super, super durable, very easy. Once you get them established, they just crush it for you. And they're typically a little bit earlier in the spring, but will continue to bloom sporadically throughout the year. There's lots and lots of different varieties. Uh, you know, I think most commonly we probably think of like the thread leaf varieties um, that typically kind of form this nice mounted shape, but there's lots and lots of different types of Coreopsis. Some that bloom like really early in the spring, one of the, you know, kind of early kind of spring bloomers, but also some that bloom all the way through the entire season. I love having a mix of Coreopsis. To me, it has that kind of wildflower look. So if you're looking for a little bit more of a, of a cottage garden, wild kind of pollinator look, Coreopsis is a great option. Very, very easy to grow, very durable. Okay, so those are just some of my nectar plants. I mean, just some. I mean, we're talking, there's probably a, a bigger list of like 50 to 60 that I could really go through. But those are some of my all-time favorites. A lot of them are perennials, a lot of them are annuals. Coreopsis is a perennial, I didn't mention that. Uh, but a lot of them are perennials, and I love perennials for pollinator gardens because the value is there because they come back year after year. But annuals are a great option as well, especially for you know my front, my hanging baskets, my containers, um, but also annuals are a great source. So I like to mix it up. I always save some pockets in a pollinator garden to plant some annuals, change it up, do different things each year, like kufia. Kufia is a great one. I didn't even put, I didn't even think about that one to put up a picture. Like I said, there's so many options but Kufia is a great one to attract uh, lots of pollinators, especially hummingbirds. Uh, so there's so many different options out there. Uh, just thinking about just salvia. You know, if we go back to salvia, there's black and blue salvia, which is one of my all time favorites, but there's so many different types of salvia out there. So 
The list of pollinator nectar plants are absolutely amazing. Lilies and irises, yeah, I mean, pretty much anything that's got pollen or nectar is gonna attract some uh, butterflies, bees, hummingbirds, so you've always got that ability to attract them. I mean, daylilies are a great option. Most people don't know, but hydrangeas actually are not bad. So if you're looking for a shade option, hydrangeas, heuchras, or coral bells. Uh, so if you've ever heard of a coral bell or a heuchra, a little kind of foliage plant, spits out these kind of little foamy looking blooms. Um, but those are a great way, especially if you're in a shade area. Hostas, hostas get those tubular flowers that hummingbirds will come and visit. So like I said, the list goes on and on and on for pollinators. Those are just some of, I think, the best. Butterfly bush, coneflowers, zinnias, lantana, coreopsis, black-eyed susan, agastache. Those are some of my all-time favorites. So we're going to move on to host plants. Now, host plants are sub pretty much completely different. I'll kind of talk about where they're kind of similar because you'll see it right here. Um, so milkweed for monarchs. So specific butterflies, most butterflies, have specific plants that they're gonna lay their eggs on and that's why we call them host plants. They're gonna lay their eggs and then those eggs are gonna hatch, turn into a caterpillar. The caterpillar is gonna eat that plant until it gets big enough to form its chrysalis cocoon, but chrysalis is what we call them, um, where it's gonna form this little chrysalis, this little, you know, kind of usually green kind of cocoon looking, uh, you know, enclosure, and then it's gonna turn into a butterfly. You can see that entire life cycle if you want to by including some host plants in your yard. You can actually do it with a, a habitat. You can do it right there kind of in your backyard. It's a great activity for kids uh, to get them interested in gardening. But milkweed is what you got to have to really attract those monarchs. They're going to stop by for some of your nectar plants. But if you don't have the host plant, then you're not going to attract monarchs. And monarchs exclusively lay their eggs on milkweed. Now, there's lots of different types. This is common milkweed. So I, I brought up, you know, you can see the flower on there. So this is actually gonna serve as a dual purpose. When it does flower, if it does flower, it'll act as a nectar plant as well as a host plant. Um, but they will only lay it on milkweed. This is common milkweed. Common milkweed usually has the biggest leaf. I think it supports the most amount of caterpillars. Um, so if you're really trying to kind of really, you know, bring in the monarchs and have enough milkweed to support a large uh, supply of caterpillars that hopefully they lay lots of eggs, um, then I think common milkweed is one of the best. Now it does spread, it is a bit of a spreader and it's not like a, uh, a real good like kind of you know clump spreader so it's not gonna stay in kind of its, in its area and just get bigger and bigger and bigger. It tends to pop up in different areas. So a little bit of a naturalizing type of thing. It's pretty easy to get rid of so if you, if you end up saying I don't really like this kind, you can always get rid of it. But if you've got a naturalized area or something where you're doing a pollinator garden, this is the all time best. And it's a perennial, it's our native variety of milkweed and so here in the Hampton Roads area so if you ever want to grow uh, milkweed this I think is one of the best ones swamp milkweed is another great option so swamp milkweed uh, gets a little bit taller but stays in its clump and gets bigger and bigger each year uh, maybe doesn't attract as many as the common milkweed but it's another great option if you're looking for something that's a little bit more maintainable a little bit more controllable uh, also can be a nectar plant so all milkweed can be nectar slash host um, but you still need those other nectar plants to really attract the most amount of butterflies. Um, butterfly weed is another option. Uh, butterfly weed is a great, so there's milkweed and butterfly weed, pretty much kind of similar. Um, don't worry about the semantics too much, but if you wanted something that's a little bit more small, these are great in containers. Uh, it's a perennial as well, comes back year after year. Um, they've actually got different bloom colors now, uh, but the orange is the most common. A little bit more of a strap-like leaf, you can see it there. So a little bit of a smaller leaf, um, but a smaller plant. So if you've got a small space garden and you maybe want to you know, attract a monarch to lay you know, three or four eggs on it, they're going to know how many eggs to lay on your milkweed. Um, so they know, you know how big the plant is and how many eggs will it, it can support. Uh, but butterfly weed is a great option, especially for a small space and a plant that comes back year after year and really looks amazing. Um, tropical milkweed, you can get this at a lot of garden centers. We carry it as well. Um, tropical milkweed is not the native variety, so we try not to use it as much but sometimes you got caterpillars and you need to feed them, you know? And so tropical milkweed's a great option. It's an annual in this area. It's got those amazing blooms that really loves, I mean, the monarchs love these down in Florida. Um, they're super attracted to it and they'll lay lots of eggs on it. You gotta plant it year after year, which is the only downfall. And we really wanna support that, that kind of local source of, of milkweed, which would be that common milkweed, swamp milkweed, butterfly weed. 
Um, but the tropical milkweed is a great option and we carry it because it's a great food source. They are very, very attracted to it. And regardless, we're trying to help them. And if this helps, then we're willing to help. And that's what we want to do is, is invite them into your yard and have a food source for them available. So tropical milkweed is another great option. So there's a monarch eating a butterfly weed. So that's actually the butterfly weed. You can see the orange blooms in the background. So butterfly weed, and that is what the monarch caterpillar will look like. I'll show you eggs here in a second. I'll show you, I've got some swallowtail pictures. So I'll show you what the eggs look like when they lay them. Um, but that is what a, a monarch uh, caterpillar looks like. It's got the white, black, and yellow striping on it. Um, you know, very, very kind of easy to kind of identify. And milkweed is designed to be eaten. I mean, it's, so it's going to look a little gnarly once it gets eaten up. That's okay. That's what you want. So if you're trying to attract monarchs to your yard to have these caterpillars, don't worry about the plants getting eaten up. That's completely uh, natural. The butterfly weed and the milkweed will take care of itself. It's completely fine. You can give it a little prune back if you want to after they're done and they form their chrysalis. Give a little prune back, a little plant food, and let it regrow. A little organic plant food is nothing, nothing bad with that. So have fun with it. They're easy to attract and it's a great way to encourage um, that population to expand more by having some host plants in your yard. Pollinator plants, just nectar is perfectly fine, but if you add some host plants, you'll be doing a little bit more as well. Now, let's talk about some other ones. Swallowtails are extremely popular. We plant herbs like dill and parsley, and sometimes we go out there and we're like, oh no, it's all eaten up. Well, uh, some people will actually be like, I want to get rid of these things. And then once we explain it to them that these are actually the swallowtail caterpillars, um, they really want to keep it going. And dill is a great one. It's one of my favorites. It's pretty easy to grow. You got to start it kind of earlier in spring, um, but it gets good size. So it's a nice big plant. You can plant lots of it. You can do it from seed very, very easily. Uh, dill, fennel. I'll show you a little picture of fennel. It's not going to be quite as impressive as this. But dill is a great option. Um, it's great for cutting, for cooking with, but it's also a host plant for the swallowtail. Parsley, I mentioned, parsley is another big one. Um, I think a lot of times people come in and say, my parsley's all eaten up. That's a great thing. It'll come right back. Herbs love to be cut and pruned and they come right back. Parsley is another easy one to grow from uh, seed as well. Now, if you want parsley for yourself, they tend to say that the curly parsley, that's why I grabbed this picture, curly parsley doesn't tend to attract as many swallowtails as the flat parsley. I don't know that that's necessarily true, but I will always grow some flat and some curly. I personally like the curly a little bit better, uh, but the flat parsley does tend to attract a little bit more of the swallowtails. So, um, so you can kind of you know pick and choose which one you want. But parsley is a great one. Uh, fennel, fennel is another good one. This is a close up of the fennel uh, leaf that you can see with eggs on it. So you can see those are swallowtail eggs. So if you ever see these little light green, almost transparent kind of, they're tiny. They're super, super tiny. This is a very, very close up shot of this. Um, but if you ever see that on your milkweed or on your fennel or your dill or your parsley, then you know you've got butterfly eggs on there and they're going to hatch and they're going to eat that plant up and the plant's going to revive itself. It's going to be perfectly fine, uh, but you'll be supporting those uh, butterflies and those caterpillars. So there's your swallowtail uh, eating up a little bit of parsley. Um, this one's a little bit different than obviously the monarch, but the swallowtail butterfly is going to be kind of that green, white, yellow dots and black stripes typically. Um, so uh, don't be afraid of them. They're not poisonous. There's nothing wrong with them. Um, and they're eating your plants for a reason and you're supporting your pollinators. So it's a great thing. All right, let's talk about some different things as we kind of wrap up here. Uh, let's talk about uh, some, di some different things that you can do in your yard to kind of attract pollinators. We mentioned hummingbird feeders. So that was a great question. I didn't actually put any pictures of hummingbird feeders. So great question, Trish. Um, uh, hummingbirds are a great thing. You know, including hummingbird feeders is a great option into your yard. But places for these pollinators to live or, or protect themselves. So butterfly houses are not actually going to be something that the butterflies are going to live in necessarily, um, but they are going to be a great place for them to go and get protected from storms. Uh, maybe just, you know, it's been a really, really hot day and they just need somewhere to kind of, you know, kind of, you know, ride that, you know, heat out or maybe, you know, spend the night here. So you're not going to typically see something kind of nesting, obviously in a butterfly house, but they will use it. Whether you see them use it or not, they will. They're great. They kind of look cool. You know, you always want to add something to your pollinator garden. You want to do something a little bit different, add a different texture, something ornamental. You can paint it. You can buy different looks. Um, there's so many different options for butterfly houses, but it's a great thing. It's a great accessory that you can add to a pollinator garden or to your yard or landscape. Mason bee houses, I mentioned that earlier. 
Mason bees are a great bee to attract to your yard. They're non-aggressive for one, which is great. They're solitary, so you don't have to have a whole brood of them. You don't have to have you know a whole colony of them. Um, but they uh, look for these holes in wood. So they're not carpenter bees, which create the holes in the wood. They're looking for natural, actual exposed holes in wood. So typically that's gonna be in trees and logs and different things. Uh, but here you can create one, you can build one yourself. We have so many options for sale uh, and there's so many different looks out there and different things. I mean, we've even got a cool one that's got like an observation part to it. Uh, so there's lots and lots of great options for mason bees. I think they look cool. So you wanna put these about three to four feet off the ground. I typically like to put them in a somewhat protected area, you know, maybe like on a fence, kind of near a shrub or by almost kind of even behind a shrub a little bit. They like to find these areas and they don't want it to be completely, completely exposed to full, full sun all day. A little bit of warmth is good. Obviously, uh, this is where they're gonna nest. This is where they're gonna lay their eggs. So basically what they do is they hatch in the spring, they come out, they pollinate lots of things, and they'll pollinate all the way through the season. They tend to kind of you know, focus on you know, fruit trees and, and those types of things early in the season that are blooming that really help the orchards out. Uh, but they'll visit flowers all the way through spring and summer. So it's a great thing to have in your yard and it's a great way to support pollinators and it's easy. Then you just go through, and then what they'll do is they'll lay their eggs, they'll pack some mud or clay in there so you'll know they're being used because you'll see these kind of holes being packed in. Um, and then they'll hatch in the spring. And then in the spring, you just go in and clean them out if you want to. You can pull those bamboo tubes out and replace them. There's lots of different you know, styles and options out there. Um, but this is a great um, uh, uh, option for attracting bees into your yard. And mason bees are a great one, and I think they're cool looking. Um, a little slight angle down is a good option so water doesn't get in there. So if it's leaning back, water can get in there and kind of you know, mess up the, the uh, nest a little bit. So just have a little bit of a slight downward angle is a great option uh, to, or a great way to kind of keep that uh, uh, mason bee house protected. Uh, bats is another really, really good one. So I'm sorry, I saw Pamela had a question. Will generala generalational monarchs remember where your milkweed patches? Uh, yeah, they definitely visit the same yards. Um, you know, is, is it guaranteed? No. Uh, having lots of nectar plants is a great way, but milkweed, typically a big patch of milkweed, will get visited by the same generation of monarchs year after year. So great question and very, very easy to do. Um, you know, you can talk to some of the, the monarch and, um, and butterfly experts to kind of get a little bit more information and kind of do some tagging and different tracking uh, ways to track them. But uh, generationally, uh, 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 is, is, is a, is, it's proven that they will come back and visit just like hummingbirds do. So hummingbirds will do the same thing. Uh, where they will come back to the same exact yard because they know that's where they got a great food source. And as they migrate, they'll visit the same areas year after year. So great question. Uh, bat houses. So bats are, uh, as I mentioned, not a necessarily a pollinator here, uh, but having a bat house on a tree, you typically wanna get these about 15, you know, 12, 15 feet up in the air, up on a big old tree. You can put it on a post if you want to, uh, but bat houses are a great way to attract uh, something that's going to to be an insectivore, eat lots and lots of mosquitoes, which is a great thing for the yard. Um, and they're just fun to kind of watch as that sun sets and they kind of come out and you start to see them swooping around the yard. Uh, just remember that as a childhood memory. Um, and so bat houses are a great thing to encourage them into your yard and into your area. Uh, so it's a great way to kind of protect them, have something safe for them. You want it a little bit of sun, so you'd love it to get morning sun, afternoon shade, which typically they will get because of, of the you know canopy of the tree. Uh, but bat houses are a great thing that you can do uh, for the, your environment, your enjoyment of your yard, because they eat so many of those mosquitoes and different insects that we don't really want. So it's a great one to, to put into your yard and landscape. Um, something that bees and butterflies that you might not know is that they drink water. They do need water. So typically butterflies don't do as much drinking of water. I'll talk about kind of a different option here. But this is one of my favorite things to do is set up a bee bath. Uh, because I think we always think of a bird bath, you know, which is a great thing for the birds. But a bee, a place for a bee to easily get to water source is a really, really good thing that you can do, especially in your pollinator garden. And the way that I like to do this is super simple. Just take a clay saucer, they're relatively inexpensive, put some rock in it, just one layer of rock and fill it with water. It's very easy to do, change out the water probably, you know, every two to three days, you know, just go wash it out, 
put a little bit of water in it. It'll take literally no time. You can do it with a watering can. You can do it with a hose. It's very, very easy to do. Um, and it's a great thing to do to help them, uh, the, the bees get a little bit of water. So they, they, they like to sit on the rock and drink the water out of the cracks in between the rocks. So it's a place for them to land and get a little bit of water source. Now, the stones in that bee bath will be great for butterflies and, and, and moths as well. This happened to be a picture of a moth, uh, but um, they love to sun themselves, especially on those cooler spring days when you get some monarchs a little bit earlier or, or some swallowtails or moths um, that you want into your yard. They love a nice flat rock that they can sun themselves on. So that is a great thing to add into your pollinator garden, into your landscape is a couple stones, flat stones, or even just the bee bath is enough that they'll come and just lay out on and warm themselves up a little bit. Uh, I also really, really encourage, if you're thinking about adding plants to your landscape to encourage pollinators into your yard, give them a place to feel protected as well. So grasses, evergreens are really, really good. Broadleaf evergreens, I mean, so, you know, big camellias or chindo viburnums, I don't, sorry, I don't have examples of that. Um, but even just evergreens like conifers, like arborvitae and Leyland cypress and different things like that, something that they can kind of get into. Grasses are a great one. Uh, it's one of my all time favorites to add to a pollinator garden because they're, they're easy for butterflies to get into and protect themselves. Uh, you know, they can get into it, they feel protected. Not a lot of things like to get into a grass and mess with it. You know, they're deer resistant, all of those great things. Um, but this is a great uh, thing that you can do to protect your local pollinators, especially, you know, when I talk about broadleaf evergreens, like a big chendo viburnum in your yard or camellias, some of these bigger, older evergreens, even big old azaleas. You know, we mentioned the hummingbirds uh, earlier and, and wanting them to feel protected. So when they're visiting your hummingbird feeders they, and they feel like a predator might be nearby, then they want somewhere that they can dart off into and be protected. So having some of those bigger evergreens nearby, some grasses is a great thing to do to help them make feel protected. Um, now, let's talk about space. I think a lot of people think, oh, I've got to have, you know, a devoted 10 by 20 foot space to have pollinator garden. No, you don't have to. Anything that you can do that helps the local pollinators is a great thing. So just hanging a hanging basket with lots of blooms on it is a great thing that you can do. While you might not ever see a bee or butterfly or hummingbird visit it, I guarantee you they most likely are. So, you know, having something that's constantly blooming on your front porch or patio, or if you live in an apartment complex, you know, somewhere that you can, you can, you can hang something or put a, a container out, it's a great thing. So no matter what size space you have, big or small, you can help your pollinators. And a hanging basket is a great option. I also found this picture, which I think is great because you can do containers. You know, this is a very small space garden, a little bit of a front foundation bed, but lots of containers, window boxes, hanging baskets, containers out by the front. You know, so many different things that you can do to attract pollinators um, and help out pollinators. And looks good. So you get kind of the best of both worlds. So what I always encourage people to do is help out in any way you possibly can. If you're afraid of bees, then you know, trust me, they're there to, to, to just uh, visit your flowers and get the nectar and the pollen and move on. Uh, butterflies uh, are a huge hobby and becoming more and more of a hobby, but just planting nectar plants will help them out. You know, putting up a bat house or a butterfly house or a bee house, a mason bee house, there's so many different small things that you can do that just have a major impact. So if we're all helping, if we're all doing just a little bit, then we'll be able to help out globally, nationally, locally. It's just a great thing that you can do. So that is kind of my kind of run through of generally speaking what we can do to help pollinators. Um, it's a great time to talk about it um, year round really, but here at the Garden Center, McDonald Garden Center, we're always concerned about our local pollinators. Um, you know, as I mentioned, one of every three bites of food, 80% of plant life on earth. So super, super important to us. We got to protect them. We got to think about them. We got to, you know, help them, encourage them, give them a food source, give them some host plants, places to hide, places to protect them, um, and do everything that we possibly can. And just a little bit goes a long way sometimes. So I hope that helps you and I hope it encourages you to uh, explore the world of pollinators in your own yard, but also nationally, globally, locally, and do everything that you possibly can to help them out. So I hope you all enjoy this. I think I saw a question and Pamela said, check bird baths to rescue bees that may be looking for H2O so they don't drown. Bee bath is an answer. That's a great option, Pamela. Sometimes what I like to do with a bird bath is just put one large stone in the middle. So if a bee does fall in, it has a place to kind of climb out, dry out, and fly off. 
um, and the birds won't mind it either. So great, great point is check your, bee, your bird bath and your bee baths um, you know, consistently so we make sure that, that it's a nice, safe place. Great comments, everybody. Great questions. Uh, this was so much fun. I hope you all enjoyed this. I hope you all have a great day, and we hope to see you here at the Garden Center. If you don't live in Arnold Woods, uh, visit your local Garden Center. They've, they're the experts in your area, um, and they'll know all about your local pollinators and what plants um, are the best natives, you know, native bars, all of those different options, you know, nectar plants, host plants, all the different things that you can do. Um, so come in and see us if you're in our neck of the woods, and we hope to see you soon. Bye, everybody.